Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live stream. Uh, my name is Dave Duarte, uh, and I am not a channel swimmer. In fact, I think I can just barely manage 10 lengths at my local swimming pool. But uh, I've been very inspired by Lewis Pugh's series, and I realized that there are lessons that we can all take from those brave individuals uh, who, attempt to, who attempt that cold swim of at least 32 kilometers between England and France. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Lewis Pugh. Lewis, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning, Dave. How are you? Yeah, very well, man. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We've got a lot of questions uh, from people who thoroughly enjoyed your 22 tip series. And that's why I proposed this live stream so that we can have a bit of a chat. So, uh, Lewis, we're going to dive straight into it. These tips uh, have been really warmly received. But, um, you know, at least from my perspective, I think that they apply to other challenges beyond swimming the channel. Would you agree? I think so. I hope so. I mean, I think that we all have our own uh, channels to cross this year. And um, if you look through the 22 tips, um, they I think they apply to almost everything. So, for example, uh, in sequential order, it's about having a dream, having a very, very clear vision, planning, preparing, uh, training for it. And then if things go wrong, problem shooting, and then having that grit and having that determination to actually finish the job. So I think this applies whether you perhaps want to start a business, whether you want to go back to school and start studying again, or whether you want to climb Mount Everest. It, I think it applies to almost any endeavor in life. Mm, that's, that's certainly how I'm going to be approaching it. So Lewis, quite an auspicious day for us to be doing this. Today is the birthday of Captain Matthew Webb. Uh, yeah. who became the first person to cross the English Channel in 1875. So I did a bit of reading and I watched a few videos about him uh, and everyone thought that he would die and that it was impossible to do without a special suit or some kind of mechanical assistance. But he did it and it took him 22 hours. I mean, I, I can barely imagine that 22 hours with the cold and the waves. Uh, so, I, I mean... Lewis, for me, it seems extreme. Why did you first decide to swim the channel? Yes, well, happy birthday to, to, to Captain Matthew Webb, who has inspired people ever since 1875. The English Channel has and always will be the Everest of swims. So it's not the hardest, it's not the longest, it's not the coldest uh, swim, but it is a swim which um, whoever you are as an endurance swimmer, everybody aspires to going and doing the English Channel. And why is that? Well, because there's so much history. Uh, it's also, it's a wonderful experience when you swim from one country to the next country. That feeling when you finally arrive in France and you put your feet down on the sand and then you turn around and you look back to England and in the far distance, you can see the White Cliffs of Dover. That's a very, very special feeling. And I think the other reason why people always want to swim the English Channel is because it's, it's in terms of sport, because it's been going since 1875 when Matthew Webb did, did it, you can compare yourself to everybody in the past and also our successors in the sport will be able to compare their, themselves to the times and the speeds which we have swum today. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, well, so I actually, I do get that. And it, it must be a monumental feeling to actually complete that challenge. Um, Lewis, can you tell us about your first channel swim? Yes, yeah, so I did my first channel swim in... So I've only swum uh, the width across uh, once. Uh, I've done the, the length once. <laughs> And we'll never ever do that again. Okay. <laughs> but you, thought, the, you were the. I think. You, you, am I correct? You're the only person who swam the length of the the length of the English Channel according to Channel Association rules, right? Yes, correct. I mean, it's it, it's 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 an incredibly long swim. So that that's that's 528 kilometers. It took me 49 days to do that. Um, but when I swam across. Um, uh, the, the thing that I remember, so my pilot was a, was a man called Richard Armstrong, and I remember meeting him the night before, and he said, um, would you like to have a go tomorrow? The conditions are going to be a little rough to begin with, but they should flatten out, and you should have a really nice day. 
And uh, you can wait for days upon days upon days in Dover for the right day. So when the right day comes, you need to take it. And so I said, okay, I'll go for it. We arrived uh, at his boat very, very early in the morning. And I remember diving in and it was literally like a washing machine. I remember looking at my coach, Peter Bales, and then, and I didn't verbalize it, but thinking to, him, thinking to him and thinking, gosh, Peter, have we chosen the wrong day here? And he just had a calming influence on me. And Peter said, just keep on going, keep on going. And for the first hour, it was like a washing machine. Every 30, 40 strokes, I was swallowing uh, water. And then in the second hour, it was still bad. Third hour, it was even worse. Fourth hour, it was still bad. Fifth hour, it was still bad. At this stage, I was thinking, if this carries on any longer than this, I will not see France. And then just as I was having those thoughts, it started calming down. And then by the sixth hour, it was as completely flat. It was as flat as a mill pond. But by that stage, I was absolutely exhausted. The last few hours, I literally had to grind it out until finally I put my feet down in France. I walked up to the beach. I sat down on the beach. I gave the beach, the sand, a beautiful kiss. I turned around. I was so exhausted. I remember Richard uh, shouting to me from his boat, Lewis, okay, swim back because he couldn't bring the boat up uh, right up against the shoreline. So he wanted me to swim the 100 meters back to the boat. I was so exhausted. I just couldn't do that. And I said to him, no, please bring the tender out. And so reluctantly, one of the crew members rowed that boat the 100 meters, put me on board, <laughs> back into the boat. And then we sailed back to England and I was cold. He put a big blanket around me, put me in the wheelhouse and then uh, a four and a half, five hour journey all the way back to Dover. By that time, I was absolutely exhausted. I walked into the hotel. Uh, it was called the Churchill Hotel. It's, it's, it's still there on the beach in Dover. I went into my bed and I just fell completely asleep. Oh, it sounds like one of those threshold moments in life. There's so few of them and they are so precious when they come. Uh, Lewis, uh, Captain Matthew Webb, you know, this is another time. Captain, Captain Matthew Webb said his crossing was powered by tea, ale, and a nip of brandy when he was stung by a jellyfish. So how important was a specialized nutrition uh, and supplements uh, in your diet? How, how important was all, all of that level of speciality for you? Well, so nothing's changed. If you want to have brandy during your swim, you can still have brandy during your, 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 your swim. Um, I think nutrition is important, uh, but everybody is going to have a view on nutrition. So you say, well, should I be eating this or should I be eating that? And everybody is going to have, have their view. All I would suggest when it comes to nutrition is make sure that you try out what you want to eat many, many, many times in training. That's the first point. Secondly, make sure you, tr you try it out in the sea, in salt water. So, for example, I think everybody knows how much I love chocolate. You try to eat chocolate in the middle of the English Channel, it becomes like cement in your mouth. It just doesn't work. And lastly, make sure that you have variety because it's a long swim. Most swims are somewhere between 12 hours and 15 hours. Um, and you eat normally every half an hour. And that's the fun. It just, just breaks down the boredom. And so make sure you have lots of different things that, that you can eat uh, during that crossing. It that said, I believe your superpower is Marmite. Uh, this is a, a well-established scientific fact. Um, <laughs> Lewis, um, you emphasize in your 22 tips the importance of technique. Mm -hmm. So how specifically do you work on your technique alongside the presumably rigorous fitness training that's required. So you've got all of this fitness and endurance that you need to build. How do you work on the nuance of your stroke or any other technique? Yeah, uh, technique is so important, especially when you're gonna be swimming across the English Channel. So swimming is the only sport which operates on three axes. So your head moves left to right, your arms move around and around, and your legs move up and down. If any one of those is out of sync, then you are gonna be fighting the sea. And you don't want to be fighting the English Channel. So uh, getting your technique right is absolutely crucial. And I just don't think that you can spend enough time on technique. Spend, spend a lot of time on technique. And one of the best ways of doing this is to go to a specialized coach 
So for example, somebody who's got an endless pool, which has got video cameras in there. And what that person will do is that coach will then get you to swim in that flume and then they will start speeding up the, wa the, the water and then you'll start swimming faster and faster. And the faster that they turn up that speed, then they can start seeing all the problems. So maybe it's just with your head or maybe it's your feet or maybe it's a number of different things. But then they can start, they can list the things which are going wrong and then start fixing them one by one. I think the other point which I'd like to say is the older you get, and I say this now, I'm 51 years old, the older you get, the more you have to work on stroke. And that is because over a lifetime of swimming, you can start picking up some really bad habits. And so sometimes you need to go back to school. So for myself, I'm now training for a really big swim. I'm now going to be going and training with a guy called Stuart Hacker, who's got a place called the Swim Cube in Northamptonshire. He's got a great flume there. He's got an incredible reputation for training uh, endurance swimmers. And then he's going to look at my stroke. He's going to film it. And then he's going to start going through all the different things which we can fix now before I do this next big swim. Excellent. Well, yeah. Th thanks very much, Lewis. Uh, look, while we while we on that, I've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, this one is from Malcolm DJ from the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. Um, <laughs> Malcolm uh, says, um, asking about tip eight, measure everything, which I presume relates to what you were speaking about about the endless pools and so on. Uh, simple question. Malcolm asks, what's the best watch for measuring time, distance, and speed with swimming? Oh, Dave, this is a really good question. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I remember when we started swimming, uh, you know, when I started swimming back in the, in, in, the, in the late 1980s, I mean, we just didn't have these smart watches. There, there's an awful lot of smart watches on the market at the moment. I mean, I use uh, this one here, which is a, uh, it's a Garmin uh, 935. Um, I find it really good. It measures speed, it measures distance, it measures time, heart rate, water temperature, you name it. But there's a lot on the market. Uh, Sunto have also got a, a really good watch. But have, have a shop around, see which, which fits your budget. But, but uh, do make sure that you measure absolutely everything. Because when you can measure things, then you can start improving them. Well, thanks for that, Lewis. I think, you know, wh one more from... Uh... Johanna Mary from Hove in East Sussex in England, uh, speaking about measuring, she says, I'm swimming at 2.7 kilometers to three kilometers, three kilometers um, per hour. I class myself as a plodder. I worry that I'm not fast enough. That's a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is something, this is a, the, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, here's the point. Uh, Sprinters do not get to France. Plodders get to France. You've got to find yourself a, a consistent and a comfortable pace to get all, all the way there. Swimming at three kilometers an hour will definitely get you to France. Okay. Most people are even slower when they get into the English Channel. So please don't worry about that. Just remember that. Plodders get to France, but snails don't. So you have to have a certain speed, but your speed is sufficient to get to France. Mm. Well, you know, I think it's difficult to get that e exact balance. So I think, you know, how do you tell? So, uh, Lewis, can you speak a little bit about coaching? I mean, it's something that you mentioned in the series. And it seems to me, one of the impressions that I got is the English Channel uh, isn't a solitary sport at the end of the day. I mean, you've got to do the crossing, but you have a whole support team around you. Do you really need a coach? What's the role of a coach? Um, no, you don't need a coach. Okay, I mean, so if if you live in a in a very very small village and there are no swimming coaches there, and well, then you, you can swim the English Channel without a coach. But I just think a coach really really helps. So this is somebody who is going to look at you, set out a program, work with you all the way along, and most importantly, fix your technique. It's really really difficult to be able to fix your technique to self fix it. What you need is you need somebody outside the pool who's saying, listen, your head is not moving, moving right, your legs are, are splaying, whatever the case may be. So I think a coach um, is, 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 is an important, plays a really important role. But also make sure that you find a coach who suits your personality, somebody who inspires you, somebody who gets you up. I trained for many, many years um, with a man called Brian Button. So in my career, which has been 35 years, I've had just five coaches. Uh, Brian was the longest. And 
I used to really, I used to get up in the morning to go to training, to be with Brian. He was such an inspiration. And um, he got me to the level which, which I was able to get to just because he was such an inspiring person. Um, so make sure you find a coach who fits your specific personality. Some people want to be shouted at. Some people want to be cajoled. Some people, you know, each coach has got their own specific style. Make sure you find somebody who fits your fits your ethos in life. Mm, I love that. Well, uh, you know, Lewis, I mean, what I get from that is it's it's very much, it's your crossing. You've got to do it your way. Uh, mm. So re reflecting then, you've given 22 tips. It's a lot. Is mm. there any one tip out of those 22 that's kind of a non-negotiable, a make or break then? Or are they all up for the best? <laughs> that, that's, that's a really good question. Um, uh, th th these are tips. So you don't have to uh, adhere to, to all of them. I think that your chances of succeeding if you follow all these tips are infinitely better th than, than if you didn't. But I do think that there is one tip out of these 22, which if you don't adhere to, you will fail. And that is about choosing the right day. So I don't care who you are. If you choose the wrong day and you go out in really rough conditions or the tide is, is incredibly strong, you will not get to France. So I, I've seen swimmers, average swimmers, get to France because they had patience, because they waited, they chose the right day, and then they went for it. So I think that tip is non-negotiable. I would say the second tip, which is non-negotiable, and this depends on where you come from, is about cold water training. So just a few days ago, I had a query from a Singaporean swimmer. He's swum in three Olympic games, so obviously an outstanding swimmer. Singapore produces some really good swimmers. Uh, he asked about swimming across the English Channel. I said, of course, you're going to make the English Channel, no question about that. But the big thing for you is to make sure that you do the cold water training because obviously Singapore is on the equator. There's, there's, there's no cold water near. So he's going to have to come to England beforehand. He's going to have to do a cold water training camp and then get used to the cold. And obviously, he, he's a very, very good swimmer. He's fit. He's strong. And I'm sure that he'll be able to do that. But just if you come from Singapore, if you come from Malaysia, if you come from Florida, these type of places, that is also an important factor to bear in mind. And, and it's no coincidence that, you know, the great cold water swimmers come from these cities which are near cold water. So you think about San Francisco, New York, Cape Town, Perth, Sydney, Dover, and obviously Plymouth as well. These, this is where the majority of great cold water swimmers are coming from. Excellent. Well, Lewis, I think that that answers Sean Burke's question. Uh, what's the best way to get comfortable uh, in the cold? Any additional tips or is that it? Just live in somewhere where there's cold water and get used to it. Uh, well, so, so firstly, you need to acclimatize to the cold, right? And it takes time. So you can't, and there are people now who are saying, well, I'm trying to swim in, I, I don't know, in, uh, in Scotland now, and the water's three degrees in the sea. How on earth am I going to be able to swim the English Channel? Okay, there's a massive difference between swimming in England or Scotland in winter and then um, uh, swimming across the English Channel where the water temperature will be about 18 degrees. In fact, if you are training to swim the English Channel, I don't think there's any benefit right now in training in water, which is two, three degrees. That's not going to help you to swim across the English Channel. So you need to do the acclimatization in order to be able to swim across the English Channel. I think the second thing is that people who are physically fit are better able to withstand the cold. The third point is that people who... Um, who are who have eaten well? Who are who have the right nutrition? They're able to withstand the cold. But the last thing relates to your body composition. You can be and 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 listen to this one. You can be fat and fast, and you can swim across the English Channel. You can be fat and slow, and you can swim across the English Channel. You can be you can be thin and fast and swim across the English Channel. What you cannot be is thin and slow. If you're thin and slow, you will not make it to France. It's as simple as that. Fascinating. Um, well, Lewis, uh, I, think, I think I've got a question in from Ben Taylor from the UK. 
Uh, and I think relates to that. It's, uh, are there any tips for land-based training during COVID? Mm, I, I've received this question an, an, an awful lot. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I spent two seasons kayaking. So um, I, I live here in Cape Town in South Africa and here kayaking in the sea, what they call surf skiing. So these are kayaks, which are ocean going kayaks. You sit on top of them. Uh, here, this is an incredibly popular sport. And I live in a village where of the top 10 paddlers in the world, at least five come from this specific village. And so I spent two seasons training in a double kayak with the world champion, a guy called David Mocker. And we, we trained incredibly hard. We raced uh, every single Friday night, every weekend. And what I found was that that was hugely, hugely complementary to my swimming. Now, during the lockdown, I've been going to a gym and they have an ergo, so a, a, a rowing machine. I've also found that has been absolutely incredible. So those two sports, I think, really do help. So while COVID is on and beaches are closed, perhaps where you are or local pools are closed, get onto an ergo or get, uh, get kayaking in the sea or in a river. It will all help. Please don't worry about not being in the sea right now. Most of the training only starts after Easter. So now you need to be fit, you need to get strong, and you need to start getting yourself mentally prepared to swim across the English Channel. All right, excellent. Well, Lewis, just speaking about mental preparation, um, we've got a question that's come in from your foundation team. So uh, th this came in on Twitter. And if anyone else has questions on Twitter, please feel free to shoot them through. And that is, why did you choose swimming as a mechanism for change? Uh, thank you. I mean, I think it's such a, it's so graphic, you know, so I, I do swims in some of the most remote parts of the world um, in places which are endangered. And I swim in some places which have changed so much over such a short period of time. So for example, high up in the Arctic, I'm swimming in places which until recently were completely frozen over. So it sends a really stark message that you, uh, you are swimming in a place where you couldn't swim just a few years ago. So I think, uh, I, I think that provides a, um, that's the reason why I think it's such a good mechanism for change because it shows something so simply and so clearly. And also the media follow it. So, I mean, if I was kayaking in the Arctic or if, uh, if I was rowing in Antarctica, I don't think it would be such a good uh, mechanism for creating change because there's something about diving into the sea and committing 100%, which seems to uh, bring the message just clearer and more vivid to the, to the public. Mm. Yeah, it's thrilling. I mean, there you are, you're in the elements and, it, it, you know, it's part of that danger. And of course, Lewis, I mean, you, you've you rigorously trained for that. You know, I think that uh, the idea that um, you, you know, that anyone doing the, the kind of extreme things that you do is reckless is the exact opposite of the message. All of the training, all of the preparation is actually about making sure that you're safe enough to do these things. And that was something that I learned from the first time that I ever hiked with you, you know, the importance of preparation, the importance of safe awareness. And, and I think that that leads to our next question, which is from Ruth Hogan. Oh, no, sorry, this one is from... Um, uh, Debbie Schmidt from uh, Weilberg in Germany. Uh, Debbie is worried about ships in the middle of the channel. Yes. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Um, so the English Channel is one, if not the busiest shipping lane in the world. So there's an awful lot of ships and they are going in a number of different directions. So you have some ships coming from the North Sea, going into the Atlantic. You've got some going from the Atlantic up into the North Sea. You then got cross channel ferries. So there's a lot of shipping. And you mustn't worry about these ships, though. And that is because the Coast Guard on either side, so in England and in Cap Grenet in France, they will be liaising with your boat. And when you come to cross one of these shipping lanes, they will be liaising with the, with the captains, with the skippers of these tankers, these ferries, and urging them to slow down, speed up, divert, so that you can get safely across uh, to France. So please don't worry about that. And if there is any danger, your skipper will 
pull you out the water, get you onto the boat and get you into, into a safe place immediately. So you shouldn't worry about all the ships in the English Channel. Excellent. Well, uh, Lewis, that's all very well, assuming that you can see where you're going. So Ruth Hogan uh, from Brighton asks, any tips on goggles? Mm, goggles are crucial. Goggles are crucial. If you find a pair of goggles and they're not fitting your face, uh, after one hour, it's irritating. After two hours, it's painful. After three hours, uh, <laughs> it really is really irritating. So make sure that you choose your goggles. A number of different factors. I've got a pair of goggles here. So number one, make sure that your pair of goggles has got a really nice seal to them. Number two, so if you can hear that, that little um, suction sound, it's important to get that. Okay, number two, make sure they're comfortable. Okay, you, just, you could be swimming for 15 hours, even longer. If you've got goggles which are not comfortable, that's going to be a killer. And then number three is make sure that you can see through them. Sounds obvious, right? But if you're going to be doing some of your section at night, make sure you have a pair of goggles, which is very, very clear. If you're going to be swimming during the day, you need to have some where there's a reflection so that you don't have the sun burning into your eyes for long periods of time. Lastly, if you are swimming on a day where it is utterly miserable, where the sun hasn't is not shining, where it's rainy, it's stormy, try find a pair of goggles which has a yellow tint to it. When you put those goggles on, the whole world seems a lot better. Last tip is make sure you have a variety of goggles. So I change my goggles regularly during the swim. It just relieves the pressure on the face. Uh, I start seeing things uh, better. And it's just um, a change is as good as anything when you are going through 15 hours of swimming. So those those are my essential tips on, on choosing a pair of goggles. Very good. Well, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, these equipment, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a tech geek, so I'm loving all the gadgets involved here. I know there aren't many, but we'll take what we can get. I, I think well, on well, a well, level, yes, sorry. Well, well, what I would say is, you know, I'll never ever forget when, you know, back in the 1990s and prior to that, I mean, goggles were very, very rudimentary. Okay. And it was just I remember like foam. It was just like one size fitted all. And I remember having goggles which literally used to grind, grind the, my, my nose. Now, I promise you, you will find a pair of goggles that will fit your face. There are so many on the marketplace. They're absolutely beautiful. They're comfortable. But as I say, do make sure that you have a couple of pairs so you can change them around. And also, if accidentally you put, you do that and you get some grease on your goggles, okay, you then want to be able to change it and get a new pair so you can see properly. Mm, good, good, solid advice. Backups. Um, Lewis, uh, DFAK80 asked uh, two successive questions, and, and I think it's really important. Uh, you mentioned a distance of circa 35 kilometers per week in training. How did you split this? And how did you build this up over time? I'm not sure what... what, what um, uh, what they mean by how do you split this? But it's uh, I, I think it's it's 21 uh, miles from England uh, to 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 do to uh, to um, to France, 32 35 kilometers across. Um, I think what I think what's, questions uh, in training. So like in a week, would you do uh, every day five kilometers, or you know, where, uh, how great. do you generally? Do it? That's a, that's a, okay. Great question. So I, you've obviously got to build up to it. You can't just suddenly start swimming 35 kilometers. But, the, but the, the general rule is that at your peak of your training, you should be doing at least 35 kilometers uh, in, uh, the, in that one week period. How you split that up is, is up to you. And what a lot of people do is they do what they call a split channel just a few weeks beforehand. So let's just say they're going to do a what they think is maybe a 10-hour English channel they would do five hours on the one day, and then they would do five hours on the next day. And then after you've done your split channel for about three weeks prior to actually doing your swim, you start tapering down. Excellent. Well, Lewis, that leads to, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left. I just want to talk about relay crossings. Um, yes. You know, I, I can't imagine swimming 35 
kilometers in that in that cold water so uh, do those count could i say if i'm part of a relay that i've crossed the channel of course okay but you, i mean you you you've done a, diff a, a different type of english channel the rules are very very simple so you can pick as many people as you would like the norm is to choose round about six people four or four or six people and just remember so if you're going to do a four man four person team you uh, you will swim and then you'll have three hours off and then the next person will uh three hours off and then you'll swim again and if you do a six person team you you'll swim for an hour you have five hours off and then another uh then you do another time and then you have five hours off i i think relays are fantastic okay just be aware of one thing when it comes to relays. Relays can be really tough because everybody else thinks that everybody else is training. Make sure that you do the training as well. I did one relay team, one relay swim, where I hadn't trained really hard and the other three had not really trained really hard. And we absolutely, I mean, it was one of my toughest swims I've ever done. And uh, remember, you've only got three hours rest. And just as I was recovering, I was then back in the cold water. The second reason why a relay team, a relay swim can be a little tougher is not just because you won't have done all the training, but because the pilots choose the stronger tides for the relay teams. So they choose the best tides for the solos to give them the best chance of crossing, but the tougher days they give to the relay teams. But again, uh, relays are magnificent. It's a way of experiencing the English Channel uh, it's a way that the young people can also experience the English Channel. When you've done a relay, you realize you can probably do it yourself. And so I think it's a great introduction to the English Channel. And it's also yeah, a team yeah. Everybody yeah, loves team. Yeah. And, and you share it with everybody. But you've done it. It's wonderful. What yeah. a memory. Well, well Liz, look, let, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Um, any final piece of advice for people who've watched this, who haven't done a channel, but they would love to do it one day? Yes, uh, one last piece of advice, and I would say this, that some people, um, I, I, they, they come up to me and they say, Lewis, I've always dreamed about swimming the English Channel and I want to do it in, and they say, two years' time, three years' time, four years' time, five years' time. If you've always dreamt about swimming the English Channel, now is the time to do it. Don't set a goal which is so far in the future that you never achieve it. If you've always dreamt about swimming the English Channel, start training today wise words uh, thank you so much for the advice Lewis. very inspirational and uh, i know that uh, uh, you know you'll be online uh, still answering questions for those that have it uh, flying the flag for open water swimming and thank you for the inspiration today